Let's continue our study in Revelation chapter 11, the temple of God and the two witnesses. Don't forget to subscribe if you like these teachings. Revelation 11 verse 1. Then I was given a reed like a measuring rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. Stop right here. Is this temple that is being measured in heaven or on earth? The next verse makes this very obvious. But leave out the court which is outside the temple, and do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles, and they will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. Okay, this is obviously not a temple in heaven. The outer court has been given to the Gentiles, and they will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. The Gentiles here are referring to the non-believers because they will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. To tread something underfoot is to mean not having regard for it or destroying something and stepping on it, putting it under your feet. The Lord promises us when we come back after the great tribulation that we shall trample the wicked. In Malachi 4.3, You shall trample the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet. On the day that I do this, says the Lord of hosts. Why will they be ashes? Because most of them will have been burned up in the great tribulation. So John was told to measure the temple of God that is there. There are Christians who say, the Jewish temple is not to be rebuilt. If it is rebuilt, it is for the Antichrist, because the temple of God are believers. Well, God calls what John is told to measure the temple of God. These people also claim, John said concerning Jerusalem in Revelation 21, 22, But I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. But when is Revelation 21? That's after the 1,000 year reign of Christ. This is after God makes a new heaven and a new earth. Read how chapter 21 starts. Revelation 21, 1. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And which Jerusalem is this? There's two. One is in heaven and one is on earth. This is the heavenly Jerusalem. John says in Revelation 21, 10 and 11, And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Some people don't know this. But some of the holy things, like the temple, the Ark of the Covenant, and such, are copies of things in heaven. Hebrews 9.24 For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands. Made with hands is referring to things on earth made by men. Which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself. Now, to appear in the presence of God for us. When Moses made the tabernacle, he was told to make it according to the pattern which he saw. That means there was one in heaven at that time. Hebrews 8, 4 and 5. For if he were on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve the copy and shadow of the heavenly things, as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he said, See that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. Some people are confused and don't realize what's on earth are copies of things in heaven, or they think God doesn't want the one on earth. But that's contrary to God's word because God wants these copies on the earth. Let's continue. And they will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. 42 months is three and a half years. 
This is likely to happen at the second half of the Great Tribulation, after the two witnesses are killed. After the two witnesses are killed, the Gentiles take over Jerusalem, and the Jews flee into the wilderness for 1,260 days, which is another three and a half years. Revelation 12 is where it tells us the number of days, 1,260 days. But here it says 42 months. When the Jews flee into the wilderness, the Gentiles will be free to tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. Now these two verses tell us the Jews will likely rebuild their temple. However, the place where the temple was believed to be there sits the Dome of the Rock, a Muslim holy site. The Muslims believe the Dome of the Rock is where Muhammad ascended to heaven and met God. Muhammad ascended seven levels of heaven. At the first level, he met Adam. At the second level, he met John the Baptist and Jesus. At the third, Joseph. The fourth level, Enoch. The fifth, Aaron the sixth, Moses, and then the seventh level, he met God. There God told him, Muslims are to pray 50 times a day. As he was going back down, Moses met him and said, 50 is too many. Ask God to reduce it. So he went back and forth nine times like this until he got God to make it just five daily prayers. That's how the story goes. So this site is holy. To Muslims. So with the Dome of the Rock sitting there, the Jews can't rebuild their temple. But here's the catch. When the Jewish temple was destroyed by the Romans, they completely leveled it. You couldn't even tell where the temple stood. The words of Jesus was fulfilled when he said concerning the temple in Matthew 24, 2, and Jesus said to them, do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. Then in the second century, a temple to Jupiter was built there. Then in 691 AD, the Dome of the Rock was built over it. However, there was also a Roman fort in the area during the time of the Second Temple. There is a good chance the Dome of the Rock was actually built over the old Roman fort and not over the temple site. Remember, the Romans completely leveled the Jewish temple when they destroyed it. You couldn't even tell where the temple stood unless you were alive and saw it. If the Dome of the Rock is not on the temple site, the Jews can rebuild their temple because there is enough room there for the Jews to rebuild the temple. And as verse 2 says, But leave out the court which is outside the temple, and do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles. When we get closer to the end, the Lord just might somehow reveal the true site of the old Jewish temple, and then the rebuilding will begin. The Jews actually have everything they need to begin worship in the temple. All they're lacking is the temple itself. There's a lot of interesting things just waiting to happen. I believe the Jews also have the Ark of the Covenant. I'll make a video about the coming third Jewish temple and the Ark of the Covenant. Now the temple needs to be rebuilt for end time purposes and also probably for Christ's millennial reign. When Jesus reigns on earth, there will be a temple on earth and a temple in heaven. The temple isn't supposed to be a place where God wants us to worship. It's just to serve as a copy of what's in heaven. There is a temple of God in heaven right now, but that will be done away with after Christ's 1,000-year reign on earth. After Christ's 1,000-year reign, God will make a new heaven and a new earth where there is no temple. God and Jesus will be the temple during that time.
Verse 3, And I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. 1,260 days is exactly three and a half years on a 360-day calendar. God is going to shorten the seven-year Great Tribulation by using a 360-day calendar and counting that as one year. So for the first three and a half years, 1,260 days, the two witnesses will be prophesying. After they are killed, the Jews flee into the wilderness where they hide for three and a half years, another 1,260 days. So the seven-year Great Tribulation appears to be two sets of 1,260 days. Verse 4, These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. This verse takes us back to Zechariah's prophecy of the two olive trees. And this verse also tells us that a prophet is a lampstand as well as an olive tree. I'll post a link to that study above and below. I do not believe these two witnesses are Moses and Elijah or any other Old Testament saint. God gave clues about what he's going to do in the end time. He left pictures all over the Old Testament. However, he never brought back a deceased Old Testament saint to continue their ministry. If they were Old Testament saints, God would tell you, look out for these guys. But the Lord simply calls them my two witnesses. Besides, Moses and Elijah appeared in glory on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus. They are currently in heaven and they are immortal and incorruptible. The Bible says flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. And the whole point of being made immortal and incorruptible is so you never have to die again. The two witnesses will likely be two people completely new, born in their generation, like John the Baptist, the end time Elijah, who comes before the two witnesses, will also be someone born in his generation, someone completely new. Now, I believe the two witnesses right now are Orthodox Jews. They do not believe Jesus is their Messiah. But after the rapture, these two guys will turn to Jesus and become the two witnesses. Right now, they are probably like Saul before he became the Apostle Paul. They are very zealous for God, but they don't know Jesus is their Messiah. The reason I don't believe they are Christians right now is because if they were, they would go up in the rapture with the church. Of course, I could be wrong and God will simply leave behind two very godly Jews to be the two witnesses, but that doesn't seem like something God would do. They will more likely accept Jesus after the rapture and encounter God in a very powerful way that transforms them into the two witnesses. Verse 5, And if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. And if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this manner. I do not believe the fire that comes out of their mouth is literal fire. A bullet will kill the two witnesses faster than they can shoot fire from their mouth. I believe this is power to execute by speaking the word of the Lord, which is likened to fire. Peter demonstrated this when Ananias and Sapphira fell down dead at his feet. The Old Testament Elisha symbolizes the two witnesses. The king wanted to kill Elisha because of the famine in Samaria. The king blamed Elisha and God for the calamity. The king sent a messenger to kill Elisha while Elisha was sitting with the elders. In 2 Kings 6.32, we read, But Elisha was sitting in his house, and the elders were sitting with him. 
and the king sent a man ahead of him. But before the messenger came to him, he said to the elders, Do you see how this son of a murderer has sent someone to take away my head? Look, when the messenger comes, shut the door and hold him fast at the door. Is not the sound of his master's feet behind him? The two witnesses will know when someone is trying to kill them, and they will be able to kill them first through the power of God through their mouths. Maybe their enemies will spontaneously combust and start burning with fire. Look, that guy just caught on fire and burned to death. He must have been trying to kill the two witnesses. Verse 6, These have power to shut heaven so that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy. And they have power over waters to turn them to blood and to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. Now, just because they have power to do these things, it doesn't automatically make them Moses and Elijah. It only makes them powerful prophets like Moses and Elijah. If it is Moses and Elijah or Enoch, God would simply tell you. The Lord never promised to send Moses and Enoch. He did promise to send Elijah, but Jesus made known that the Elijah forerunner is someone completely new, like John the Baptist. Verse 7, When they finish their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. The beast is the Antichrist. He overcomes them. Verse 8, And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Places have spiritual names. Jerusalem spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt. The USA has a spiritual name, and that name is Ephraim. You can watch that video in the link above. Then those from the peoples, tribes, tongues, and nations will see their dead bodies three and a half days and not allow their dead bodies to be put into graves. How will people and nations see their dead bodies for three and a half days? We'll expect all the major news channels to be there covering this event, CNN, BBC, and all the others. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them, make merry, and send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. So the main job of these two witnesses is to torment the earth. Their job description to strike the earth with as many plagues as often as they desire also tells us this. Some say one of the two witnesses is Elijah. Well, Jesus said Elijah is coming and will restore all things. Elijah's job is to restore all things. The job of the two witnesses is to torment the earth. They don't restore anything. If you're new to this channel, then this is all new to you. Let me explain very quickly. The end time Elijah restores all things and prepares the church for the rapture. Once he's finished, he'll get raptured out with the church. After he and the church are gone, the two witnesses will appear during the Great Tribulation. Verse 11. Now after the three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them, and they stood on their feet, and great fear fell on those who saw them. God gave a picture of this through Elisha's bones. Remember, Elisha represents the two witnesses. Elijah represents the end-time Elijah forerunner. 2 Kings 13.21 So it was as they were burying a man that suddenly they spied a band of raiders and they put the man in the tomb of Elisha. And when the man was let down and touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood on his feet. This is to foreshadow how the two witnesses will rise and stand on their feet after they are killed. Verse 12, And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here! And they ascended to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies saw them. 
In the same hour, there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. In the earthquake, seven thousand people were killed, and the rest were afraid, and gave glory to the God of heaven. Now this next verse is important because it gives us a time frame. The second woe is past. Behold, the third woe is coming quickly. The second woe is the sixth trumpet. It was already blown back in Revelation 9. Here, it is telling us it is past. The story of the two witnesses is introduced after the sixth trumpet because they die after the sixth trumpet. After they die, this verse tells us the second woe is past. It has already happened. It is past. The two witnesses likely proclaimed the sixth trumpet. Then it was blown, and soon after, they got killed by the beast. Remember, everything after Revelation 10 is just plug in the events. Some things are out of order. Verse 15. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. The seventh trumpet is the end of the great tribulation. It's as this verse says, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Also, we were told in Revelation 10.7, When the seventh angel is about to sound, the mystery of God would be finished. The seventh trumpet is placed here because God is putting the themes of the trumpets together, somewhat together. He inserted the two witnesses between the sixth trumpet and the seventh trumpet because they get killed after the sixth trumpet. Verse 16, And the twenty-four elders who sat before God on their thrones fell on their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was and who is to come, because you have taken your great power and reigned. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged, and that you should reward your servants and the prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. Then the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple, and there were lightnings, noises, thunderings, an earthquake, and great hail. So in heaven, God has his temple and the ark of his covenant. The ones on earth were only copies of what's in heaven. Don't forget to subscribe, and if you would like to partner with me in this teaching ministry, the links are down below. I greatly appreciate all your help, guys. Thank you so much. And until next time, let us continue to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Oh, I love you, Jesus. Amen. God bless you. Bye-bye.